Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all of you. I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to this event, uh, focusing on the challenges of culture. And in culture, we will include uh, religion. Uh, as some technical matters, uh, we are recording this event. The recording will be available on the Berkeley Center website soon. Uh, I encourage you to pose questions in the Q&A box, which is the little uh, picture down at the bottom of your screen for any of you who have not been initiated into uh, this world. So with that, let me start. I'm Catherine Marshall. Uh, I'm a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center at Georgetown University, sitting in Washington, uh, DC. Uh, and this is an event I've been looking forward to for some time. Uh, I think one of the central challenges in development, we all know, is adapting to local circumstances. Uh, and that means adapting to the culture of each community without having cookie cutter solutions, uh, without assuming things, without knowing about it. So one of uh, the people who has thought most about this is Bob Klitgard, who is a university professor now at the Claremont Graduate University. Uh, I should say that he and I are colleagues from way back. Uh, and among other uh, areas that we have worked on together, he was part of a fascinating event called the Journée de Réflexion uh, that we participated in together in Senegal uh, and which is featured uh, in the book. Uh, but I would also mention that I think I have to admit, despite the fact that the Culture and Development Manifesto is a fantastic book, that his book Tropical Gangsters comes the closest to an adventure novel for the uh, development profession. Uh, and he also just very recently, one of his older books is being republished, which I gather is quite an unusual feat. And it also has a tantalizing title adjusting to reality. Uh, so what we're going to do today is to listen first to uh, Bob, I think tell us a little of the story of how this uh, manifesto uh, came about, uh, how, he, how he got involved uh, with it and where he's come out. Uh, he is also, in addition to being a scholar, uh, an eminently practical a uh, person who advises governments, uh, businesses, uh, the IMF, the World Bank, everyone else at many different levels. So what does he actually think we should do about it? And that will be followed by Shanta Devrajan, uh, who leads the MSFS development concentration uh, at Georgetown, but he was quite recently uh, at the World Bank uh, as, a, as a lead economist uh, so he's going to situate these challenges in the context of the Georgetown uh, Development Studies programs. Uh, we'll then, if, if there's time, we'll have a couple of back and forth challenges. I've actually encouraged Bob also to challenge us, as well as us challenging him. And then we'll have time for questions from all of you. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Bob Klitgard. Good morning from California, everyone. It's good to be with you. So cultural diversity matters. Religious diversity matters. Taking it into account matters, right? So many people say that until you look at how people take it into account. And then you go, wait, now that I think about it, maybe we shouldn't take it into account. So let me give you some examples. Anthropologists say this all the time. Consider Joe Henrich, one of the most famous current anthropologists a wonderful scholar with remarkable combination of experiences, field work in three countries, mathematical modeling, game theory labs, and original work that's very famous about uh, evolution of cultures and genes and institutions together. In his 2016 book, Henrich summarizes a bounty of research. He says, cultures include everything from customs to habits, values, and norms and in his overarching metaphor, a collective mind. He shows that cultures evolve with climates and technologies with visits from one place to another, 
and that they end up hardwiring us in some ways, including our minds and our bodies. Now, for the purposes of what we're going to talk about today, three points stand out. First, he's not afraid to measure cultures. Well, he's perfectly aware of the fact that there are fissures within cultures and blurred boundaries across cultures, but he's not afraid to characterize and measure cultural differences. Second point, he believes many policies have failed because they don't take culture into account. The science of cultural differences has practical applications, he says. Indeed, he became, began studying anthropology, he said, with the hope of applying what he was learning to make the world a better place. Third, however, he doesn't say how to do the applying. For example, the last sentence of his first chapter says, culture has important practical applications for how we build institutions, design policies, address social problems, and understand human diversity. But by the time we reach the last page of his last chapter, these practical implications are just reminders that, quote, the imposition of new formal institutions imported from elsewhere on populations often create mismatches. The result is that such imposed formal institutions will work rather differently or not at all. End of book. He provides no examples of policies that could take account of those differences or perhaps of changing those cultures on the ground. The knowledge is potentially there, but the applications not yet. Or consider economics. Now, there's been, Shanta will tell us perhaps about the explosion of work in the last five to 10 years and the quantitative rendition of cultural differences and their inclusion in some of the usual econometric work that is done. An exhaustive re review was done recently of the economics literature on culture and development by Gérard Roland at University of California at Berkeley. In the end of, the, of this long paper, uh, he says, a first and very important conclusion is that taking culture on board means, first of all, first twice in the same sentence, to take into account the effect of different cultures when designing development policies. One should take cultures as given and see what the best development policies are given the prevailing culture. Particular policies or institutional reforms must be tailored to fit the existing cultural environment. This is how they work best. Now, despite a barrage of cross references and citations throughout the paper, there's nothing in that paragraph, nor is there anything that would support through example or theory, this policy conclusion. Now, since this conversation is a conversation, let me ask Shanta and Catherine a question. Catherine, you pioneered work on the interfaces between religion and development, right? Now, suppose people say, take religion into account and then back off and say, whoa, 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 I'm not, we're worried about that. Why do you think they're worried? Catherine? Uh, I would say two things that we mean, which are the sort of no brainers. Um, the first one is to know something about the communities, the institutions and what they believe and how it affects uh, their development. And then the second is to know something about the people. So you know at least who to ask uh, and the questions. Uh, but one of the biggest caveats is a word called in, uh, instrumentalization, uh, which has been invented, I think, which is the danger of using religion to do what you want. Okay. So there's Shanta, you've analyzed development around the world and done it with the World Bank and using modeling techniques, econometrics. When people say um, we should take cultural differences into account in these models, why do you think many economists are worried about how to do that? Thanks, uh, and it's good to see you, Bob. Uh, I think I, I'm gonna go even further than maybe you had expected, which is to say that there are also real dangers in taking culture into account. Uh, there are some pitfalls uh, because what we think of as a cultural difference, first of all, sometimes these cultural variations or cultural aspects bump up against our notion, some fundamental notions of equity that, that we, we hold uh, sacred. And then sometimes we actually attribute, the wrong, uh, attribute it wrongly to culture. Let me just give you the example of of girls' education, 
Now, we observe, for instance, in many uh, countries, particularly Islamic countries, that there, there's low levels of uh, school enrollment uh, for, for girls. I mean, in Pakistan, there was a clear uh, uh, lack of uh, enrollment in secondary education in, uh, for girls. And some people attributed that to a cultural difference, that these parents didn't want their children to go, uh, uh, to, go to school. And you could say, well, that's a cultural difference, so we don't. We need to take that into account when we when we draw our our policy uh, implications. But then we started looking at it more closely, and you realize the main reason these girls are not going to school is that it's dangerous for them to walk to school. They can get harassed. They can get robbed on the way. It is purely a practical matter. They had no objection to them going to school, except that it was dangerous. So then you can actually design an intervention using pure economic reasoning to try to solve that problem without necessarily then saying, oh, it's a cultural thing and we should stay away from it. Right. Thank you. So complications are one problem. It's hard to measure, hard to conceptualize. Another problem is misuse. We can start blaming victims. We can start resigning ourselves. Oh, if it's a cultural question, we can't do anything about that. Or we can say, we've got to change the culture. The Lancet published a paper yesterday, which argued that the looseness tightness variable across cultures could explain if you're one standard deviation tighter in your culture and one standard deviation looser, the difference is a factor of nine in number of deaths per million people from COVID-19. And the authors conclude, we've got to do something about changing those cultures. Ooh, so that's why we're so scared of this question. Culture matters, cultural diversity matters until we start saying, what are we gonna do about it? How are we gonna study it? And then we go, hmm, maybe not. Now the Cultural and Development Manifesto says we can do better and shows us how to do it. To begin, let me give you a metaphor of Robert Putnam who really got the term social capital going a few decades ago. And Putnam said that culture is like the symbolic soil in which policies, programs, and politics take place. Shanta, maybe you could mute your mic. I'm listening to you gurgle there very, very eloquently. <laughs> so his argument is if we understood the symbolic soil better, <laughs> I don't know, what am I muted or something? All I'm doing is seeing Shanta here, but uh, making me thirsty, Shanta, okay. So how do soil scientists actually work? Well, they analyze soils with partial measures, the, you know, how much absorb, absorption capacity is, the prevalence of certain minerals, a whole lot of variables that can be in a little handbook that you can actually measure that. So they go in and they talk to the farmers and they say, I don't know as much as you know about your soil. I don't pretend to tell you what crops to grow. But you know what, I've got some experience measuring some stuff that you may not know about. How about if I do that? And they come in and they take potassium and nitrogen and phosphate and loam and so forth. And they come back and they show the farmer metaphorically, here's a book from experience around the world that shows in these kinds of soils, these kinds of plants grow best. What do you think? And the farmer says, you know, I'd still like to grow carrots. And so like, luckily I've got another book for you. For these kinds of soils, if you wanna grow carrots, Here's what we know about soil treatments, how to change the soil with fertilizer, irrigation, cross-cropping, shade trees, and so forth. And so there's a practical guidebook from experience when they don't know, they don't know, but there's a partial and incomplete characterization of the soil that is useful because it brings outside knowledge to the farmer who is still respected for her or his sovereignty over the decision what to grow and how to do it. Notice the soil scientist also works with other people, with agronomists, with economists, with a private sector, and so forth, to provide a battery of services that might be useful to farmers. So I think this metaphor is useful for us when we think about the culture and development problem. Can we be more like soil scientists, as anthropologists, as social scientists, as policy researchers? Can we try to provide partial and incomplete measures of local conditions? that might be ten, uh, tempered by international experience in order to help local people make better decisions about the policies to adopt or not adopt. We would listen to the locals. We would try to provide them our knowledge boldly and humbly. We're bold because we try to take social science seriously. 
about cultural differences. We don't just leave it in the background and say, oh, well, we should be culturally sensitive or religiously sensitive. We take the substantive knowledge seriously, but we're modest in the sense that our aim is to help other people think through these questions and think through their trade-offs. We eschew the idea of Marcel Moss, of the fait social total, the total social fact that we would somehow grasp, or even Max Weber's total system that would able be, be able to understand all the possible unintended consequences of policies. Rather, we have a humbler metaphor of the anthropologist as soil scientist or us as soil scientists getting our feet dirty and our hands dirty in the field. Now, I want to give an example, and it's Eleanor Ostrom working in Nepal. One of the questions she worked on was common pool resources, in particular, uh, irrigation systems and forests. And as you know, both of these are subject to the fact that if we don't take account of the externalities we create by our actions in a forest or in an irrigation system, the whole system will work much less well than if we do. But taking account of that means enforcement systems, information systems, credibility, le legitimacy, and so forth, all of which go way beyond the technical parameters of the forest and the irrigation system. So many social scientists faced with the cultural, political diversity on the ground of this would have said, well, you're not too hard. So, but Eleanor Ostrom didn't. And instead, she exemplifies an approach which I'm recommending in this book. She was bold in her hope that learning about common property resources, learning about them from the perspective of social science would be helpful for the far farmers themselves. They could learn the principles. So you, taking knowledge from around the world, she helped farmers understand five kinds of property rights that come in bundles, access, withdrawal, management, exclusion, and alienation. She shared a research, research on seven types of rules that were often used in common property resources and conveyed those. But she was also humble. She appreciated in her heart as well as her head that the Nepalis were sovereign, not her. She was not telling them what to do. Prashanda Pradhan, a Nepali wrote, she was really a field worker. She strongly believed that we learn from the farmers and we have to give to the farmers what we have learned. So she propagated the idea from farmer to farmer. The combination of theoretical knowledge and local listening that she did led her to identify local conditions that were particularly conducive to effective collective action. Users have common interests. They play high, place high value on a resource into the future. They support effective monitoring. The accurate information is valued and communicated, and it's feasible to establish some binding regulations. She didn't do all this to derive a solution to tell them what to do. She did this to create culturally attuned designs that might help them solve their problems. Now, I wanna emphasize three things she did that I think will extrapolate to other things that we can do. First, she provided data. She provided, for example, for Nepal, 215 coded cases were put into a data set about irrigation management systems. So people could see where they fit in the world of irrigation systems in Nepal. She also then went on to get um, typologies. So she, she gave, gave data, got data available on the irrigation system's physical condition, the quantity of water available, and the agricultural productivity of the system. So people had data there to sort of see where they were doing and how well they're progressing. So first is data. Techniques and abilities came from outside, but were used local knowledge and shared them in appropriate ways. Two, case studies of success. She showed them examples of other farmers managing irrigation systems outside Nepal who had succeeded in facing even harder problems than those. And this gave a big aha moment for the Nepalis. It's not just us. It's not just our local politics. It's not just our culture. This is a problem that we can appreciate in a new way than we thought of before. And to help them do that, those frameworks and checklists I mentioned, the analytical principles. And this combination of data to help locate the problem, examples of success to inspire people to think differently, not so much to copy, but to think about that differently is uh, is the big contribution. Now, toward the end of her Nobel speech, she won the Nobel Prize in Economics, Lynn Ostrom said, thus it is not the general type of forest governance or irrigation system governance that is crucial for explaining the conditions. Rather, it's how a particular governance arrangement fits the local ecology, how specific rules are developed and adapted over time, 
and whether users consider the system to be legitimate and equitable. In the book, I provide many other examples of advances where we take culture into account. We together, outside expertise, local people working together. I'll just mention two briefly and then get to what's the manifesto about. One is from American Samoa. The historian Joanna Poblete published a wonderful book uh, last year, which looked at fisheries in American Samoa. And, and like many other places in the world, they're suffering, they were suffering from almost a collapse. According to a 2000 report, harvested species such as giant clams and parrotfish and so forth are overfished and there's heavy fishing pressure on surgeon fish. Fewer or smaller groupers, snappers, and jacks are seen. Most village fishermen and elders believe the numbers of fish and shellfish have also declined. But five years later, after the start of a community-based fisheries management program, an evaluation found that, quote, the biomass status of the American Samoa bottom fish complex by 2005 is healthy. What led to the success, again, was a combination of outside knowledge and local knowledge done respectful of local cultural norms. Here's how she describes it. The success of marine programs in American Samoa revolves around the understanding and incorporating aspects of Fa'a Samoa, the Samoan way of life. The inclusion of Samoan traditions and beliefs such as Va, social relations, and Va Fealoa, social respect, in the process of creating rules and procedures have established, enabled the successful implementation of American style industry, government, environmental expectations, and policies in the region. Another example, which I feature at some length in the book is from West Africa. It's the 6S program by Wadriago and others whose underlying idea in one paragraph was this. The underlying idea is to analyze a situation by comparing the views of all the members of the community as well as the external actors to identify jointly reasons why existing organizations have seized up and to support without any preconceived design the measures and reforms that the group deems both feasible and desirable. What I call convening is a process that tries to do all these things. It tries to bring people data, examples of success, and a framework that could be used to principles that could be used for understanding the local situation, perhaps reframing local discussions away from cultural determinism or the legacies of slavery or the problems of too much communism in the past or too much capitalism in the past towards something different. In a convening, the climate of the culture and development problem that we talked about earlier, when somebody's trying to come in and tell you what to do based on your culture or religion, or the terrible, tremendous task of trying to build the complete model that includes the cultural variables correctly over small samples, that's transformed. The idea is no longer to apply a culture by policy, by intervention outcomes model to the local situation. It's not to carry out a detailed ethnographic study of that place. It's rather, or nor is it certainly to invite an expert from outside to tell you what to do. Rather, its a, agenda is to discover and be more creative about the problems on the ground, the objectives to be sought, the alternatives that are available, and the constraints, and to do so together. On this view, policy analysis, including cultural aspects, provides not so much a set of answers that decision makers should do or citizens should adopt or bureaucracy should implement, but instead data, examples, and frameworks that help locals enrich their appreciation of alternatives and consequences. So what's a manifesto? Uh, it may suggest a slap in the face. The, uh, face, the origin of the word is Manus, man, hand, and offense, fendere. So you've got a hand creating offense. And in fact, manifestos are often defined by what they decry. A quality Mary Ann Cause, who wrote a book about manifestos, called their againstness. She says, a manifesto is peculiar and angry, quirky or downright crazed, always opposed to something particular or general. It not only has to be striking, but to stand up straight, unquote. And manifestos can be rude. One of my famous is the beginning of the Dada Cannibalistic Manifesto. I'm sure all of you read that from 1920, which begins, you are all accused, stand up. Well, that's not my message here. And, and you may be seated. You don't have to stand up. 
nor do I want to Hector. Lee Scrivener concluded a manifesto on manifestos with a persuasive warning. They should never explicitly or implicitly advise others about what they should or shouldn't do, or say, or believe. So rather, let's look for something more inspirational and hopeful in a manifesto. Consider this art statement by the great Canadian photographer, Freeman Patterson. Every artist is, first of all, a craftsperson, thoroughly knowledgeable about the materials, tools, and techniques of his or her particular medium and skilled in using many of them. However, in my view, no amount of technical knowledge and competence of itself is sufficient to make a craftsperson into an artist. That requires caring, passionate caring about ultimate things, unquote. Or consider the metamodernist manifesto. Quote, we see this manifesto as a kind of informed naivete, a pragmatic idealism, a moderate fanaticism, oscillating between sincerity and irony, deconstruction and construction, apathy and affect, attempting to obtain some sort of transcendent position as if such a thing were within our grasp. In a similar spirit, the Culture and Development Manifesto is not advising anthropologists to be economists or economists to be anthropologists, and it's not primarily saying we should all be interdisciplinary. It is proposing, and I hope illustrating, how we might all become more engaged, more constructive, bolder, and humbler, technically equipped and passionately caring, and perhaps pragmatically idealistic. One more thing I want to say about that. So the book contains applications where a subtle appreciation of cultural texts leads to fewer cultural misunderstandings, where they can be an antidote to poisonous texts that disrupt negotiations, where they help unpack different possibilities for, quote, taking indigenous institutions into account. There are also in the book theory light, non-quantitative, but still scientific ways to adjust to cultural diversity in the design of stoves and road signs and housing for the poorest, in agroforestry, in tailoring pedagogies to local cultural knowledge and learning styles, in helping indigenous nations align their governance and policies to their traditions, in collecting data relatively quickly and using checklists in ways that enable rather than brand or condemn. And finally, ways to partner with local organizations that respect their autonomy and strengths and also work with them on their weaknesses, which leads them to making better choices as in the 6S initiative. In my dream world, I'd like to see policy analysis include cultural knowledge as opposed in, in a new paradigm of policy analysis and evaluation, one that goes beyond local participation and never utters the word buy-in, one that combines the best of international knowledge and local knowledge with the goal of catalyzing creativity and problem solving. So we're gonna go beyond saying culture matters. We're gonna do more in saying how we can take advantage of cultural strengths locally with the help of both theoretical frameworks and practical examples. A key in this is success stories, looking for things where we take advantage of experience on the ground where things have happened that actually worked. The great French anthropologist, uh, Jean-Pierre Olivier de Sardin, has recommended it after 20 years of his work in Mali and Niger on the health systems that we just study the local things that are actually working there and bring those bright spots up to general cognizance. That's his biggest recommendation to anthropologists, one I, I concur with. So finally, a good manifesto expresses hope. In this instance, hope that convening new combinations of local knowledge and international knowledge by sharing data surprising success stories and frameworks based on analysis and social science can help us reframe what we're trying to do and how. So let me stop there for comments and queries. You guys are muted. Turn to Shanta. Okay. Well, thanks very much. That was really inspiring. Uh, I, I'm, 
I'm fired up uh, so we can uh, <laughs> keep going for a long time. Uh, but le let me make two points, one which may, be, may sound like I'm pushing back a bit, but you can decide um, how you answer it. And the other is where I keep, I'm trying to push you even further, Bob, uh, which uh, is, I know it's hard to do. Um, on, the, on the first, um, the, the question I'm still grappling with is, at, of course you have to take culture into account. Of course you have to respect cultural differences and cultural norms, but how far are you willing to go? What if, what if the, you are told that for cultural reasons, we discriminate against a particular group in society. And that's our culture. And I hear, I hear this today about the caste system in India, right? This is a cultural uh, phenomenon um, and don't, don't try to mess with it essentially. Um, whereas my view is it is completely disgraceful um, from the point of view of equity, from the point of view of equal treatment, it is just unacceptable. Um, and I will work, even though it's a cultural uh, 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 norm, I will work to try to get around it, to, to, uh, to dismantle it in a way that actually protects people who are under underprivileged. Now, so the, the, the question is how far do we wanna go on that and where do we go? And I think we basically have to operate under a set of principles that the, these principles of equity are, are universal and we're not letting, we can't use culture as a way of compromising on that. The, but on the second point where I wanna push you further, I really like this point about providing knowledge and information uh, in a way that actually enables the, the people, uh, people from a different culture, if you like, to come up with the solutions. Um, but I want to go further than that because, you know, I think that's now pretty much <laughs> the way we do what we call technical assistance or we provide knowledge uh, uh, to, uh, to developing countries or people in developing countries. But I think the, the metaphor is actually needs to be shifted where all of this thing like providing data and knowledge sort of assumes that there's something you know that they don't know. And the problem is that we need to get, get this information to them and then they can figure out what to do with it. But I think the truth is the other way around. There's so much that they know that we don't know. And the art of, of development really is us learning from them what they know. Now to do that, to be able to actually learn from them, we have to have the knowledge and the data and the information and the background as a way of absorbing that information. But you also have to have that, that willingness, or not even willingness, the, the objective that the purpose of my visit to this country, assuming we can visit countries at some point, uh, the purpose of my visit to these countries is for me to learn from you rather than from you to learn from me. And I, I'd like to make that the, 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 the modus operandi for, for technical assistance, which is to drop the term technical assistance. I mean, God forbid, at the World Bank, we use the term mission. You go on a mission to a country. <laughs> you know, you're there to go save them. <laughs> but the truth is, it's the other way around. <laughs> they are saving you from your ignorance. Uh, by providing you with this knowledge. And you have to have a way of eliciting that knowledge in order for us to jointly come up with solutions. Very good. Catherine, would you like to uh, answer Shanta? <laughs> no, I think that's your job. <laughs> I mean, the one comment I would make is that I love your emphasis on the positive. And I think curiosity and interest and engagement but of course, another aspect is the don't do dumb things. Um, <laughs> don't build the road through the burial site. Don't uh, to, to avoid that. So I, I'm interested in balancing that. We have a lot of interesting questions, but I'll wait for you to, <laughs> to tackle uh, Shanta's challenges uh, before we go to those. Okay, well, let's take the first question. Do we draw a line some places and say, I don't want to work in a place that does this? 
Yes. Do we also see that there's my first intuition about what might be impossible there is because political will is lacking and maybe I think the political will is exogenous to my inter interference. And sometimes I find that political will is endogenous. Take corrupt places, Shanta. I've worked in lots of places that are terribly corrupt. And at some point I will decide when I'm asked to go there, I think this is all BS. I don't really want to change. I'm not going to be part of this. But sometimes I find that people in very corrupt situations are stuck in a kind of equilibrium where the political will depends on their knowing that there's a way out. And sometimes the international experience can show them that, which they have to you know, take and transmit and put into action that maybe I never would think of. On your second point, I wanna give you an example from Clay Christensen, the Harvard Business School professor who invented the theory of disruptive innovation. And he was asked by the head of Intel to address their board about applying his theory to the Intel chip business. So Christensen studied up on this and came along to lunch, but he said, along the way, I had an epiphany. Instead of telling them about how my theory applies to their business, which they know much better than I do, I'm going to tell them a story that's theory laden about how it applies to another, another industry and see what they do. So he starts off at lunch and Andy Grove is the chair. He's invited Christensen, paid him, and Christensen starts talking to another industry. I can imagine Grove was not too amused. But Christensen later reported about halfway through, Grove stopped everybody and said, okay, I got it. You guys got the theory? Okay, let's apply it. And Christensen reported that they then applied his theory to their industry better than he ever could. And his lesson from that is whenever people ask him for advice about what to do, he tells them stories about some other place and counts on their ingenuity and their passion to come up with applications that may be better suited than anything certainly he could do. So uh, Catherine, on the uh, on the neg negative side, yes, there's, uh, well, let's go on to the questions from the audience and we'll come back to that one. Let's see if the audience has any good questions here. Do you, well, would, we you have... like, would you like to monitor the questions, Catherine, and choose which ones you'd like me to address? And you could begin with the easiest ones, please. By the way, there are a lot of greetings to you. Okay. Um, but let's start with one that since we're at the Berkeley Center, there are a few questions on how to link culture and religion. Uh, and I think that also comes back to some of the questions about dynamism in culture uh, and dynamism within religion, as well as its complexity. So just if you could tackle that one, and then I'll, I'll go on to another one. It's too, it's too vast a question for, for my limited knowledge of this. You and I have talked about this and I've enjoyed your books in the past. And I think that one of the lessons I take away from the work there is it's wonderful to have examples, again, where um, people didn't feel stuck because they were in a particular religious setting or community and were able to do things that surprised themselves in terms of the things that they value, not necessarily the things that we value. So I think case studies of successful management of religious conflict management of religion and human rights, management of religion and women's issues and so forth uh, is, is one that we would love to have a principle like a convening where we had some kind of data to describe the problems there, the interactions there. I don't know if such data exists, a case study of success, which, by which I mean progress, and then some kind of framework that tries to take it out of a theocratic or theological framework and put it into some other more functional framework that helps people recalculate the problem or re, 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 reconsider the problem, not saying they have to throw away the theological, but just temporarily bracket that and then reconsider the problem from that perspective. I reckon that that would be extremely useful for local people in the same way as the culture and development stuff I mentioned. But just coming back to the sort of basic question, um, it's a bit of a chicken and an egg, but which would you see first, culture or religion? Uh, I mean, in some senses, UNESCO, for example, will frame issues primarily in, as culture with religion as, as, as a part or a manifestation of culture, whereas a religious schol a study scholar would clearly look at it the other way. So I'm just curious, when you were thinking about the book, how did you take that one into account? Yes, well, I went through, uh, in one of the chapters, I talk about the nefarious history of the definitions of culture. Um, 
The most famous example is a book edited by Kluckhorn in 1952 that had something like 165 definitions. Luckily, the author did not add, uh, did not add number 166. But a whole, spec whole realm of that is about beliefs about the deity, beliefs about afterlife, beliefs about the divine origin of rules that man have to, men and women have to follow. And so it's in the area of values, norms, and so forth, which are certainly part of the cultural thing as well. But the definitional, the fact that they could write 165 definitions in 1952, and we see the UNESCO definition is tremendously eclectic. So it's almost hard to find something that isn't cultural, according to those guys. So I, I kind of try to leave the definitional stuff behind about culture, taking heed of one final point, Catherine, that in the, uh, I think it was Anthropological Theory 2019 had a lead article about the definitions of culture. And the author said, most anthropologists have left behind the word culture, or the key cognitive term in cultural anthropology is now under disputation as never before. So the tail chasing on definitions here, especially if someone doesn't know much about religious scholarship, I think I'll leave that for other people to worry about. <laughs> You've ducked it for us. <laughs> uh, but just um, one, one of the issues that's already come up here um, that comes up time and time again is relationships between men and women and sexuality. And um, maybe you could just add some comments on how you've, um, how you've thought and addressed that. We have some implicit questions about that, but I'm, I'm putting it a little bit yeah. more starkly because it just it's in my face every day. Also, you're putting it to me darkly because in an earlier draft, when you were advising me about what to talk about in this book, you said, you haven't talked about gender. <laughs> and uh, I still haven't talked about gender. So um, admittedly, I'm not a very, uh, very good at pulling that can of worms in here. I will plead the following, Catherine, though. Uh, in the journal Philosophy and Literature, uh, last year, I published a thing called On Romance and Intimacy. <laughs> so it's not an anthropological one, but it's a literary uh, what we can say about um, the heroic journey uh, that we have in things like Joseph Campbell and the idea of providing of romance and intimacy and being part of the individual's quest for some sort of meaning and transcendence in their lives. So that's a long way off from what we're talking about, but maybe it's uh, it shows that I'm not completely unconcerned about this problem. <laughs> well, by the way, Shanta, you can come in maybe with the next one, but um, one of the... Um, themes that comes up again and again is who's involved and who do you ask? And that <laughs> certainly is a question with culture. Do you ask the traditional chief uh, or do you ask an adolescent girl um, about what they think? Uh, and the one of the phrases is, um, if you're not at the table, you end up on the menu. Uh, <laughs> so how in, in your approach, which is very much about convening. So it's about people and engaging them. Um, one of the questions notes that there are a lot of tensions within indigenous communities. There's sort of nothing about us without us. This is Marjorie Mandelson Balser uh, raises this question. How do we delicately uh, negotiate uh, internal uh, tensions uh, boldly and humbly? Uh, so how uh, how do we how do we deal with very practical questions, which, by the way, in dealing with religious communities is is an mm. is a sort of no brainer because many of the formal leaders tend to be older men uh, who don't who are not uh, who do not look like the community. Let's say so. How do you how do you get into that? So when we talk about communities and uh, outsiders first come into anthropology, they find a kind of romanticization of local communities as if they were somehow egalitarian, um, ecologically sound, you know, they were taking care of things, they were taking care of the wild animals, they have local knowledge, and they know what they're doing, just leave them alone. Until people go in there and study them more and they find lots of hierarchy, lots of dysfunctional environmental management, lots of uh, gender relations that are not in the norm of the, say, the international human rights declarations and so forth so then the question is well what do you do about what do you as an outsider do about that and i guess in some sense i would say that back to shanta's original question which is are there some places you don't go uh does that mean you're not going to work with villages that are doing x y and z and i think that's a call that everybody has to make i guess the answer i would ask is if you 
intervened in some way I've described in the, and there's a problem that's sufficiently important, could you make a difference where the delta to the problem you're solving is big enough that it justifies your complicity with that system? And I think that's a tough one. I've worked with the People's Republic of China trying to get their uh, anti-corruption thing to be less control oriented and more um, participatory and bright spot oriented. And that's a tough call for me. There are a few countries I haven't worked with because I think the, they're just too tough. So I think local communities, the romanticization is not acceptable. The saying, because they do this, I don't want to be involved at all. That's acceptable. It's, everyone can make that call. My own personal call would be, I try to make some rough calculation after meeting them, knowing them a bit, and talking to people who know a lot about that, could an intervention, and I hate that word, but could some sort of, not mission, Shanta, but could some sort of helpful relationship uh, have a, has a positive value there that's worthwhile in some currency that they want and we want. That would be the way I'd kind of, that's very abstract, but that's the way I'd try to escape it, I guess, intellectually. Shanta, do you have- Yeah, uh, just, just to add a few points, I, I agree with what Bob just said. Um, the, the way I approach it is two things. One is, I feel like our job is to give voice to the voiceless. There are, in all societies, there are going to be people who are voiceless. And ultimately, that's who we are trying to empower. Now, everybody else, and almost by definition, people we come into contact with, let's start from the government, the central government, the minister of finance, down to the, the, the state minister, down to the, the village head, headman, uh, they're all intermediaries for the voiceless. And as we have known from experience, they're not very good intermediaries. Also, they are the problem rather than the solution. So we have to be constantly vigilant that everybody we're speaking to is actually an imperfect intermediary to the voiceless and keep that in mind. So that otherwise it's, it's very tempting when somebody says something, particularly if they're flattering you and sort of taking your ideas into account to say, oh, great, now let's run with this. <laughs> but realize that they may not be representing the interests of the voiceless. Let me let me take a very practical question that's come up. Actually, I'm sorry I interrupted you, Bob. You can take them both <laughs> both at the same time. Someone says, "Does the manifesto um, speak to the preservation or protection of cultural heritage?" And that is a big issue right now. Obviously, um, parts of the UN system, but it's also part of the um, the safeguard policies of the international development banks, etc. So, how do you think about that one? So I hate, I hate to say it, but it doesn't deal with that. So when we talk about culture and development, there's a whole branch of literature that's about things like preserving sacred sites, but letting them be open to tourism. Uh, there, all, all this, all the UNESCO is, is a big example of this. So my book doesn't deal with that directly. The examples I'm talking about are culture in the sense of norms, values, institutions, and practices, and, and indigenous institutions, which have uh, a role, a role as Shanta said, they have an often undervalued role to play in solving local development problems of health, education, water, and so forth. So let's come back a little bit to this question of who's at the table and nothing about us without us. Who's the us? Uh, so how do you, again, how do you think about that? The table is a finite size. Yes, um, we're all very co concerned about diversity and how you reflect diversity, yes. even bringing in some of the ethnic divides within a community. How do you, how would you pick them? Pick the winners, shall we say? We'd have to go. We'd have to go to a local situ situation and really look at it very, very carefully and and listen carefully. And uh, let me just say though, if there's a particular situation in which people disagree about who should be at the table then I think the, the question I would say is my procedure or my method, my process might be applicable to different configurations of people at the table. So it's in some sense, it's independent of the question of who should be at the table. Not saying that's, less, that's a less important question. Of course, it's a first order question, who should be at the table. But I'm saying if they're at the table, how can we bring them data to help them locate the problems, inspiring examples, what they did and how they did it in other places and some kind of framework to recalibrate what's going on in their in, in what they see the problem as and hope that 
that combination of that in evoking local knowledge about those things will produce something innovative and, and special. But I, I'm really not, I don't have a meta theory about what sort of representation for what particular society and what kind of problem would be ideal. Okay, Shanti, you get to pick the next question, but let me put this one to you. Aza Karam, who spent many years working at UNFPA, but also did the Arab Human Development Report and is now the head of Religions for Peace, um, basically says, look, we've been doing a lot of this all along. Um, there are lots of examples. So maybe you could speak to some of the better angels uh, in addressing these issues yeah. and things that you think have been successful. Yes, well, the book is full of examples of success. Starting in chapter six, it has examples about how textual, what, what might call deconstructing development text has practical relevance as well as radical relevance. The next chapter talks about culture by policy interactions and how taking those into account has led to better forests, better stoves, better educational systems. The, the remarkable story of the Harvard and University of Arizona program with the Native American groups is just stunning and how well they've worked with those groups to align uh, the ways they organize their institutions with their indigenous cultural practices all in ways that they can decide what to do. Uh, and the success program in West Africa. Chapter nine is about the fraught problem of corruption and talks about one of the principles I believe Shanta said, which is even if a problem may be said to have cultural origins, the solutions may be economic or institutional. So because something has a cultural base or a cultural, cultural provenance, doesn't provenance does not mean that it requires cultural change to get there. Can I give one example from today? Um, there's a, I mentioned the study in the Lancet, and it's amazing. It says, um, well, we've got 52, no, sorry, 57 countries. We've got a six question thing about things like, there are many social norms people are supposed to abide by in this country. People in this country almost always comply with social norms, yada, yada. They take six, they get a mean, and they find that of the 57 countries, the countries that are one standard deviation above the mean have nine times the deaths from COVID than those below the means. So tight cultures are better in this sense than loose cultures. They have a lot of covariates, but it's all regression. They say it's not causal, but uh, th here's their conclusion. New interventions are needed to help countries tighten social norms as they continue to battle COVID-19 and other threats. Well, there's a classic example of, you know, we found a difference, therefore, uh, it must be theoretically meaningful, probably causal, and we start to go change cultures. And I just go, Oof, you know, please, let's step back and say, yes, there are better angels around. Plenty of programs where we get participatory voices. We get people telling us that we have uh, all sorts of techniques for evoking local knowledge. And yet in practice, uh, I believe that uh, Olivier de Sardin's critique has been tremendous of this at the local level in Africa, where the traveling projects come in and they do the local focus groups and they do the local tweaking of the project, but somehow the very process itself can be delegitimizing for local people. So I, I'm not taking on an establishment here that says, you know, we already do a lot of, we consult with people, we do invite locals to give us their opinions. Of course we do. I'm not saying, I'm saying there's a particular way to do that where we don't just listen to the people in Solomon's old phrase, or have these, uh, the MIT project that tries to evoke local knowledge. It is analytically based. There's actually a policy analysis or social science part of this where there are theories brought into play. There are data, there are case studies, which outsiders like us, professor types like you guys, can actually bring in and your students can bring in to people to help them think better and more clearly and more creatively about their situations without you having to tell them what to do. You can decide where to go, whether to go there, but you really can't decide, I don't think, you can't decide, you know, I don't think they should do that, so I'm gonna tell them what to do, something else. Um, I'm not sure that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm maybe getting up on a, on, a, on, a, on a podium here, sorry. <laughs> no, this is a continuing discussion. Shanta, do you wanna pick a question or put one? Could you sure. Make it an easier question, Shanta, please. Sure, no, I, this is a hard question. I, that's why I wanna ask it because I don't know the answer. Uh, um, the, from Andy Thomas, um, how can an essentially exogenous process, which is the assumption underlying much of the discussion here, facilitate the endogenous process, which is the root of effective, sustainable institutional development? 
Well, you think of exogenous processes. People around the world want to learn how to do farming better. They want to build dams. They want to run clinics. And they often ask for international help in doing that. So we begin there. And if they're asking for your help on how to set up a school or how to build an irrigation system, um, is that exogenous? I don't know. And what I'm saying, what we do is we say, you know, we have a lot of experience around the world about that. We've done that all over the world. Like the soil scientists, let me bring you my book that shows for your kind of place, your kind of goals, your kind of, here's what we know and what we don't know. Be very honest about that. And then help them make better decisions. I give the example in the book of the King of Bhutan, who's been a remarkable leader, brought them to democracy in 2007, 2008. By 2014, they had the internet going, they had some tourism much more than in the past. And his question was, how can we open up to the outside world and bring in the best of scientific knowledge and openness to new ideas while preserving and advancing our own very distinctive culture? How do we do that? Now, that's a question I didn't know the answer to. We've been talking about that, but I don't know the answer to that question. Is that an exogenous question or an endogenous question? I think it's an endogenous question. He's asking it. So if somebody says, do I want to go in and impose an exogenous whatever on them? I'd say, no, I don't. I'm, I'm eager to help them. And if somebody else wants to, I'm not sure I want to, I want to be part of that. Okay, one quick last question, because we're coming three minutes to the end, and I want to give you one last word. Um, question, what do you think about what's going on in India with the farmers' protests, and how, how do we think about that one? I haven't studied it. I really haven't, so I, I don't know. Isn't it refreshing, Shanta, to hear a professor say he doesn't know? We just don't hear that very often, do we? I hear that very often. <laughs> Okay, well then um, I'll let you see if there are any sort of final comments, wrap up comments in the last couple of wrap minutes. Wrap up comments, yeah. So some people ask me, so I have my own passions when I work on development. I really care about the voiceless. I care about the women. I care about the minorities. And how can I be an advocate? How can I be a critic and still do something constructive? Do I, do I leave my voice behind? And I find this as a chronic and inspiring problem in anthropology. As studying anthropologists, I find that they are often cultural critics following a lot of the postmodernist, uh, post-structuralist uh, theorizing. They want to reframe things in ways that undercut the patriarchy and the capitalist order and the materialism and the atomism of modern life. And they say, if I start getting into the business of making projects work better and policies work better, I have to sacrifice that under underlying critique of the whole purpose of these societies and how they work. Now, my, my suggestion there, humbly but boldly, is we do both and. We reserve part of our intellectual and spiritual energy for reforming and evangelizing. And we reserve part of it for concrete realities, working in the field. And I'll take as my exemplar here, Clifford Gertz. And this will be my last word. Gertz said, I don't have the exact quote, but he said, you know, if, if one's gonna go on about poverty and exploitation, it does make sense to spend some time watching people in Java harvesting in the rain or watching seamsters in Morocco working under the light of 10 watt bulbs. But the, any idea that that gives you whole insight into cultures means you've been too long in the bush. So it's both and it's the tacking back and forth between the concrete realities down there and the abstractions and radical reforms we want to study and aspire to up here. That intercourse, I believe, is wise, bold, and humble. Well, thank you to Bob, especially for the book and for his insight, inspiration, humility, uh, and ideas, and to Shanta for joining us and helping us, I think, to think about how we as uh, professors at Georgetown um, grapple with these issues. Uh, I will say that um, one of the more painful experiences in my memory was when I was 16 studying French mm -hmm. and had to write an essay on tout comprendre c'est tout pardonner, uh, which is that if you understand everything, you forgive everything. And the 
dual pain of grappling with the question and trying to write it in French uh, still sears and steered in my memory. Um, there are a lot of questions, more than I have ever seen in one of these events. So we didn't get by any means to all of them. So we will look at them and I'll send them to both of you, uh, see if you have any inspiration and I'll look at them myself. Uh, and I hope that this can be a continuing conversation because I think it's one of the central questions, not only for the development field, um, but for dealing with the problems in the United States uh, and everywhere else right now is understanding how these different perspectives and values um, play out. So the recording should be available soon. I'm uh, told, uh, and we will commit ourselves to continuing the conversation. So again, thank you to the audience, which has been participating so actively, and to both of you.